calmly and silently, our nearest neighbor, the majestic moon, proceeds on its journey across the sky. Majestic though it is, the moon is a dead world. No changes have ever been detected in its thousands of craters. However, the moon does produce slight changes on the Earth's surface by its gravitational pull on terrestrial waters. Every 12 and one half hours, flood tides appear. Without the sun or the moon, there would be no tides. The gravitational pull of the moon produces two tides, one on either side of the Earth, that would follow the moon if the Earth were not rotating. But the turning of the Earth causes these tides to lag and also to strike our shores twice each day. The sun likewise acts on the Earth's waters, although to a lesser degree, and the tidal pull of the sun adds to that of the moon when sun, earth, and moon are in a straight line. In this manner, the tide changes with the phase of the moon. The new moon appears as a thin crescent in the sky and sets immediately after the sun. On this day, the moon rose with the sun. The next evening, the crescent is wider and the moon is apparently further from the sun and therefore sets about an hour later. A week after new, the moon is at first quarter. This moon rose at midday and is now disappearing below the western horizon at midnight. When the moon is two weeks old, it is full, and we see it rising on the eastern horizon just after sunset. A week after full, the moon is at last quarter. It rises from the eastern horizon at midnight, is overhead at sunrise, and sets at noon. Let us assume that we could remain directly below the moon with a motion picture camera. What the camera would have photographed, we shall here portray with animated drawings. The sun is seen to pass behind the new moon, and as the sun apparently moves to the right, the crescent widens. Until finally, when the sun is behind the camera, it illuminates the entire half of the moon presented to the Earth. Less and less of the sunlit portion of the moon is visible as the sun again circles behind the moon. Note how the horns of the moon are always directed away from the sun. Viewed from a position over the earth, the moon is seen to travel in a slightly elliptical path and to complete one revolution in 27 and one-third days. The motion of the moon that we observe from the Earth is the result of both the moon's motion and that of the Earth's in space. The turning of the Earth on its axis causes the moon to rise and set. The sun's rays appear to shift in direction because both moon and Earth are on their annual journey about the sun. This is why the moon's period of revolution is about two days shorter than the interval from new moon to new moon when the moon is between the earth and the sun.
Let us suppose that we watch the moon on successive nights for two weeks. As the moon waxes, the sun is rising over the portion facing the earth. At full moon, the sun is directly over the center of this disk. By actual motion picture photography, we see in a few hours the shadows of craters and peaks diminish in length as the sun rises. Now the moon is waning, for the sun is setting on the disk facing the earth. The moon always presents the same face to the earth, and therefore the interval from sunrise to sunset is a little more than two weeks. As the sun sets, the shadows lengthen. Notice how the sunlight lingers on the peaks and edges while the crater floors are in total darkness. As the moon revolves about the earth, it occasionally passes in front of a star. At the most, an hour passes before the star reappears. Meanwhile, both Earth and Moon are traveling about the Sun. At full, the Moon is on the outside, but pulls ahead, and at last quarter crosses in front of the Earth to be on the inside. At new Moon, the Earth passes the Moon, so that at first quarter, the Moon is behind the Earth. Both the moon and the earth cast conical shadows, for the sun, the source of illumination, is larger than either the moon or the earth. Therefore, the rays of light that just graze the earth meet at some point on the far side. The same is true of the moon. Eclipses of the moon do not occur at every full moon, for the moon's orbit is inclined to the plane of the Earth's orbit, and the moon usually passes south or north of the Earth's shadow. Similarly, at new moon, the moon's shadow passes north or south of the Earth's surface. But if the moon crosses the plane of the Earth's orbit when it is full, then a lunar eclipse will occur, and the Earth's shadow is cast upon the moon. A lunar eclipse may be followed by a solar eclipse as the new moon crosses the plane of the Earth's orbit and the moon's shadow is cast upon the Earth. We watch a lunar eclipse from the Earth. The Earth is now directly between the moon and the sun and the shadow of the Earth is cast upon the Moon. But of greater interest is a total eclipse of the Sun. From the Moon, we watch the lunar shadow as it sweeps across the Earth during the solar eclipse of 1932. We trace the path of totality upon the Earth we see the shadow pass over Freiburg, Maine, from which point we shall photograph the eclipse. Patiently, we wait for the moon to make first contact. Clouds appear, and we wonder about the success of our venture. Slowly, the dark lunar disk cuts off more and more of the brilliant sun. The shadow of the moon rushes down upon us, and the corona of the sun bursts into view. For a brief 80 seconds, the sun's disk is blotted out. The moon continues on its journey, sun and moon apparently part. The complete obscuration of the sun by our moon is a sight that one must often travel many miles to see. But every month, and almost everywhere, we see the moon perform its cycle, waxing to full, and then waning to new.